You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Kylie Reese. At the end of the show, we're going to have an audiobook excerpt from Richard Fox's The Ember War. This audio clip is narrated by the one and only Luke Daniels. You're going to love this series. I love it so much. And uh, Richard has been a great supporter and sponsor of the show, and we're going to show him some love. Listen to the audiobook excerpt. You're going to love it, and uh, be sure to go to audible.com to purchase it. If you're not an Audible subscriber, you can get a free book just by signing up for a free trial at audibletrial.com slash Hank. You get a 30-day free trial. You get the free book. If you decide to cancel your Audible subscription, you get to keep the free book. and It doesn't cost you a single penny. Audibletrial.com slash Hank. And uh, listen after the show for the clip from Richard Fox. Writers, I have an amazing tool to tell you about. A revolutionary writing tool for planning stories, Campfire Pro is what novelists need to go from the seed of an idea to a detailed plan that's ready to be executed. Complete your character design, create a timeline, and track your world building all in one place with our downloadable desktop app for Mac and PC. Without the annoying subscription model so many apps are using today, visit campfiretechnology.com for special holiday pricing on Campfire Pro today. Who wants to love a billionaire? Billionaires in New York, book one by Laura Burton. Do you have a favorite writer whose books are auto buys for you? Wouldn't you love for readers to have you on their auto buy list, then recommend your books to their friends and on social media? The good news is there are subtle things you can do, things that are nearly invisible to the reader that will make your stories unputdownable. The Beyond 10 Days course from Victory Editing can help you get the most from your stories and help you build that relationship with readers through your writing. This course is full of awesome, and best of all, you don't have to fly across the country or put on pants. In this course, we'll focus on avoiding info dumps, dialogue mechanics, show versus tell in dialogue, carrying show versus tell forward to your narrative, deepening your point of view and strengthening your protagonist's voice, overwriting and how to avoid it. 10 hours of video content with text and audio downloads. Shine that diamond. Join me at the Beyond 10 Days course. Go to hankgarner.com and click the banner to sign up today. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am super excited to have Owen Coffer on the show with me today. Uh, you probably know him from his Artemis Fowl series and uh, and many other things that he's done, but he has a fantastic new book. It's called High Fire, and uh, this is one of the most unique books I've read in quite a while, and I'm super excited about it. Uh, welcome to the show, Owen. Uh, thank you. It's, it's nice to be virtually there or virtually here, <laughs> wherever we are. <laughs> wherever we are. That's, we're, we're both there, wherever that is. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Um, Owen, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Um, it goes back a long, long time. So this would be over 50 years when I was maybe – two years old or three years old and um, I knew uh, that I wanted to write the stories but unfortunately I could not actually write um, I was barely able to walk at the time but we had this uh, chalkboard in the house and uh, so I would pretend that I was writing stories and illustrating stories and which is all very cute until my mother would ask me uh, what the story was about and then I would very uh, I, w I think I was quite a precocious child I would say well if you want to know what the story is about mother read it for yourself so uh, <laughs> that, which was a quite a difficult thing to do as it was just uh, squiggles so I don't know where that came from 
why I wanted to write stories and why I thought that was an important thing to be doing when it seemed like everybody else was outside playing uh, football or uh, basketball or whatever. But I, I just always had this thing where I wanted to be writing stories and I didn't value free time spent not doing that. And uh, it's it's been the same ever since, like, but it's just transferred into my entire life rather than just free time. <laughs> Now, both of your parents were creative, artistic people, weren't they? Yeah, my mom uh, was a drama teacher, and she still has a woman's group. Uh, she was; They were quite forward-thinking feminists back in the 70s, um, and they've met every Tuesday, I think, for like 40 years now, which is incredible, and they've had, uh, in their time, they've had radio shows, they've written books of poetry, they've written stage plays. Um, and my mum then was a drama teacher too. Uh, my dad was a historian. Uh, he passed away about six years ago. And uh, But he wrote some of the seminal um, Irish tomes, um, academic works. And his, his period would have been uh, medieval times, the Norman invasion, that kind of thing. So I was surrounded with all that. And when we were young, um, there were five kids and my dad was this elementary school teacher. So there wasn't a whole lot of money, but there was always money for secondhand books and for art materials. So we were really blessed in how we grew up. And when I look back at my childhood, um, people might say, you know, you didn't have a lot, but to me, it was the perfect childhood. Right. Right. Do, do you remember um, them placing such a high priority on uh, self-expression and, uh, you know, eventually storytelling? Or was it just that they were the kind of parents that just created the atmosphere that just allowed a kid to, to find his creative voice? Absolutely. They, they just made that available if we wanted to take advantage of it. But we could see how important it was to them and how they they did it all the time. And when my dad wasn't uh, bringing us around to medieval castles, I mean, and that was a typical weekend for us. Uh, my dad would want to take photographs or sketch um, one of the local castles, so he, we would all go, uh, and it became quite a family adventure. And um, and I learned to read with my mother because she was an, an actress also. So I, by the age of four, I was doing lines with her. So she would we would sit on the bed and she would do her part, and then I would do all the other parts. So. Uh, to be doing uh, Oscar Wilde or whatever at age four, that that's fantastic. And uh, I think uh, Seamus Heaney wrote a poem about peeling potatoes with his mother where he had this special time. And I think if you have that memory of that special time that you had with your parents, uh, that, that is a magical thing. And I think that really helped to shape me as a person who wanted to be creative. I, I love it. I love that you have those memories uh, to the – what there's there is no better story for no uh, for a creative person that's fantastic um you uh you eventually uh went on to university and then followed in your father's footsteps for a while didn't you as a primary school teacher yeah my dad had this maxim i suppose we came from a time where uh, it wasn't easy to get a full-time job and money certainly was not plentiful and he knew that i wanted to be uh, a writer but he said get your degree first and get your job and then you have your passion and then over time turn your passion into your job so it was kind of a mantra with us get your education and he would say listen if you get a, a degree uh it's not going to make your writing any worse all it can do is improve it so right. i thought it was a pretty good philosophy um i mean i mean at the time i probably wanted to just jack everything in and be a writer and you know get a beret and go and sit in a small theater somewhere. But but now looking back, I see he was perfectly right because I worked around the world. I got a lot of experience all the time. I was writing plays and stories. And so by the time I did get published, when I think I was 32, I had quite a lot of life experience under my belt. I had traveled to, worked on three continents. So I was, I was ready and uh, I had a wealth of... Uh, experiences to draw on and uh yeah so i really appreciate what my dad did for me because he taught me not just the value of art but the value of a work ethic and if you're going to be a writer you really need to have that work ethic because 
the the words that are published are only a fraction of the words that are actually written uh, by you. So uh, I had kind of gone through all that and done all that, and uh, and and I still have that ethic today. I mean, I'm, I'm in my office as I, as I speak to you, and um, I've been here all day, and and I, and I love that. And I and I, but I'm really fortunate in that because I worked uh, as a primary teacher for 15 years. I still know what a real job is like and I know I'm very lucky to have the one that I do have now and that I've been able to make that work for me and for the family. Did, did you eventually succumb to uh, the beret? Uh, I have I have a flat cap which if if turned at an angle <laughs> and seen in a certain light could certainly uh, could, pass could be for confused. A beret. Right. <laughs> could, could confused, yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. Um, you know, Owen, um, there, there are a couple of things that, that you said that really resonated with me and, um, a lot of younger writers don't appreciate, uh, that stage of life before the great things take off and happen. Uh, mm -hmm. and before, you know, we're, we're known to the world as, as published authors. Uh, one is the, uh, the benefit of a day job. I think a lot of people look down on that time. Yeah. And just just want to get to the other part. But, you know, it, something that pays the bills that allows you to live fairly stress free um, while you pursue your art is uh, it is a gift, really. And and I think, for, you know, so many of us rush through that to get to the other stuff that we think is more important. And that life experience, uh, those things are, are, are two things that a writer um, are really priceless um, that uh, and. I, I love that you put that emphasis uh, on that. Um, what do you uh, feel like that working as a primary school teacher um, equipped you um, to be a writer, and especially the kind of writer um, that, uh, you know, especially the Artemis Fowl series, where you really connect with that younger audience? Do you feel like that time in primary school helped you to understand that audience better? Oh, absolutely. 100%. I would really credit my teaching years uh, for shaping my attitude towards writing for young people. Uh, the main thing I learned, I think, on a daily basis was how quickly kids will just pull the rug from underneath you. And even today, uh, I, I'm still learning that. A friend of my son's came in to the house and he, you know, he's, I said, Hey, how are you? I hadn't met him before. And he said, yeah, yeah. You write the Artemis file books. He said, yeah, the first four were good, but number five, <laughs> that was oh all, my you know, straight, straight to my face. And I thought, well, that's, and that's what kids are like. You know, you are not getting a pass. Uh, well, they'll keep any, you honest, won't they? Oh, they will keep you trying your best all the time. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, and there's no, I mean, they might be starstruck for 10 minutes if, you know, J.K. Rowling came into the room. But then, you know, once they get over that... Uh, they're going to have questions. They're going to have questions. And uh, <laughs> they and they question me all the time. And as a teacher, you see that. You see when someone comes into a classroom, a like visitor, who maybe is not used to speaking to kids in groups, and it's quite nerve-wracking. And if they're like one... If there's one scintilla of condescension in their voice... If they if that person addresses those kids as eight year olds when they are actually nine, uh, that it's it's over, it's all over, and they will destroy you. So I I learned very quickly not to talk down to kids uh, who are just as smart and often smarter than me, but just haven't had the life experience. So I talk straight at them, and uh, I think I like to make my stories quite complicated. Someone said to me once, and uh, I, an editor in my very early days that you know if you're writing stories and you want boys to read the stories uh, then those stories have to be very simple and i n have never agreed with that i i think they might have to be fast maybe they have to be pacey but they can certainly be complicated and have a you know a high standard of vocabulary uh, and that's something i like to put into all my books uh, it's i agree with people like oliver jeffers who say if if it's a good book, then anybody who's who is able to read it will enjoy it from nine to ninety. And uh, I like to follow that particular ethos when I'm when I'm writing my books. So, but the main thing is you just do not talk down to those kids. You treat them like adults, 
but you make the books appropriate. So it's a adult language all the way, but just, you know, age appropriate for those kids. Sure. That's great advice. Um, Owen, I'm, I'm fascinated by um, ideas that, that writers have, um, you know, the, the age old question that, that writers always get asked, where do you get your ideas from? And, you know, the simple answer is ideas are everywhere. If you just you open your ears and open your eyes, uh, there's plenty uh, around to that can, you know, kick off a story. But there's something that's a little different about that golden idea, the one that just floats a little higher above the others and that you just you feel in your bones that this is going to be special. When when you first um, discovered Artemis Fowl, when, when you first met this character, do you remember what your first uh, inkling or interaction with this character was? I do. I mean, it, it's one of those few times where I can actually trace it back and point to something and say this was – uh, the moment and uh, for me i saw a photograph a family photograph uh, of my little brother donald who was making his uh first communion or first holy confirmation and in ireland in the 70s when you were making these sacraments um you had to wear quite a formal suit and that is it's much more casual kids can wear you know a nice jacket and, and good chinos but in those days it was a formal suit shiny shoes proper tie and my brother was wearing, uh, it was like a Roger Moore, double-breasted safari, 70s suit. Uh, and he had a very impish smile on his face. And it occurred to me that he looked like, for all the world, a, a little James Bond villain. And I thought, that's quite a funny idea. You know, a James Bond villain who's 10 or 12. And I, and I put that away for a long time. Uh, and it, it came back, kept coming back to me, and and I thought, what would this James Bond villain kid be after? And I thought, well, if he's Irish, he's obviously going to be after the leprechaun's gold because that's the oldest story uh, in the Irish arsenal. So um, I started to put this story together about how this 12-year-old kid was trying to steal the fairy gold. And it very quickly became obvious to me that the fairies weren't the stars of the show. It was this kid, even though he was a bad kid, um, his journey from being a horrible kid um, to nice kid through this act of stealing gold. It, it became fascinating how you could make that work um, where he was a sympathetic character. So uh, yeah, it, took, it took me about a year to put the storyline together. Uh, and when I finished the first draft, and my wife, Jackie, is kind of my first reader, initial point of contact. And up to that point, I had written six books and she had said, yeah, that's oh, great, honey, you love the book. That's great. But when she read Artemis, it, it was a different uh, tone. It went very businesslike. She just said, OK, you have to get an agent. <laughs> and that was, to me, I thought, oh, that's kind of a a special thing to say because it's 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 actually more than i love this book it's i think pe i think people are going to love this book and you need to make sure that you look after yourself so uh that was um and that was in 2000 the year 2000 uh, and i rang an agency because someone told me don't just send in the book you have to ring in and tell them to expect the book and trying to get a name so i rang an agency in london and an Irish girl answered the phone. And, uh, Ireland is a very small country, so I was able to connect with her. Oh, yeah, you know, we said we both knew Dublin well. We've been to this place, been to that place. And she was so friendly. And eventually I said, who uh, can you pass this on to your boss, the agent? And she said, uh, I'm, I'll tell you what, she's gone on holidays. She takes one book. If your book is here by Friday, I'll give her your book. Uh, and back in those days, you, you couldn't just email. You had to post in the book. So I posted it in. I think it was Monday. And luckily, it made it by Friday. And Sophie read it on holidays. And uh, she she came to see me the following week. And uh, I signed up on the spot. So it was when it happened, it really happened very quickly. And it was all because my wife said, you need to get an agent. Because other than that, I think I would have just not wanted to rock the boat with my publisher. And I would have just gone along and signed it up as usual. 
One thing that I love about your writing, Owen, and, and this is true for Artemis Fowl and in, in the new book, High Fire, um, it seems to me that you love to live in this this place of contrasts. Um, you know, we, we've got Artemis, who has uh, definitely becomes uh, kind of an anti-hero. It, he's um, someone that we wouldn't normally root for, yet we we love him as a character, and we um, you know we find some sort of you know honor uh, you know in in him. Um, and uh, you know we've got fairies that uh, are high tech, and um, you like to take these. Um, these tropes and the, these common things that we all know and, and twist them around and, and do something new and exciting uh, with them. Uh, what is it about that, you know, t- taking the, the old fairy tales, updating them, taking a character who does things we wouldn't normally endorse, but then we become, uh, you know, come to love him. Uh, what is it about these kind of opposites and these contrasts that you love so much? I, I like to go, that's actually... Um, what you pointed out there, it is one of my modus operandi in, in that I like to go into an accepted genre that's pretty established and that everybody knows the rules and then just tear up the rule book and switch everything around. Because my feeling on that is if, if I'm going to do a fairy book, it's been done so brilliantly um, by so many fantastic authors there's not really much point in me going in there and trying to compete in that arena because you just, you're not going to do a better fairy book than Lord of the Rings, for example. So what's the point uh, in trying to do that? So the only way my book can be worth something as, as a, as a, as a piece of work is, is if it's different and if people say, Oh, no, I wasn't expecting that to happen or I didn't, I didn't think you could have a guy like that in a book like this. And is it okay to have a funny sci-fi book? Is that okay? And uh, and shake shake it up a little bit. And it's it's really just for me. I mean, I it's to keep me interested. As right, any writer will tell you, as you and as you know, if you're sitting in an office yourself for eight months of the year or nine months of the year, it has to be interesting for you. You have to be invested in what you're doing and uh and the only way you can do that is to write something that you think uh is is new now nothing is totally new or even very new but uh, maybe if you can get a 10 percent uh swing on it that hasn't been put on there before that's a good result for me right well, the uh, the Artemis Fowl uh, series. How many books uh, have been published in that series? Uh, there were eight eight books in that series. Eight. Yeah, and, and and is Artemis uh, finished? Have you put the closing chapter on him? Uh, kind of. There won't be any more Artemis Fowl books, but I, I'm doing a little a little spin off up with his little brothers called the Fowl Twins. So uh, there'll probably be three in that series. I don't see me ever doing a big series again. Um, that took a long time. I mean, I suppose it was 15 years doing that. And uh, towards the end, I was ready to finish it. So now uh, I'll do that. I've had six years away. I'm excited about the twins. And uh, so I'm going to do maybe a trilogy of those. Uh, but I, there's so many things I want to do, so many challenges out there. And I'm really lucky in that Artemis was such a big hit that I can – take time to do these smaller projects that I might not normally be able to do. I'm doing some theater again, which, which I really like to do. Uh, I'm writing some sp- scripts to see if I can get them made. So yeah, it's, it's a really nice time, exciting time full of challenges. Nice. But, but my first love is always the books and stuff like the twins and high fire. That's where I suppose the real, uh, connection is that I can actually go out and meet people who've read it and, to, to man, I still get a huge thrill when people tell me, you know, uh, your book is up there on my bookshelf with someone like Neil Gaiman or Terry Pratchett. I mean, that's I, I love to hear that. Uh, <laughs> I, I always I will take that. Uh, so you know, it's it's a great. Um, I'm really happy with the way things have gone in the last few years, and hopefully, I can keep going for another. I've, I think I've done forty two or three books. I would love to get to fifty. That would be amazing. Uh, that would, that be, would be a nice body of work to leave behind. 
I I believe I believe so. <laughs> yeah. Well, Im- imagine imagine um you know how I felt when your publicist contacted us and then sent us a copy of High Fire, and and I've got it and I'm looking at it and I'm like is this is it that Owen Coffer? <laughs> and uh, I, I start reading the book and complete departure yeah. from uh, your other work that I've read. And I instantly loved it in that Terry Pratchett kind of way. Yeah. Um, I'm right. glad that you referenced him a minute ago because I, I got those same kind of feelings. And, um, you know, God bless him. Um, I, I hate that he's yeah. gone on from this world. Um, but this book um, couldn't be more different from the things that you've done, yet still has your unique voice. Um, what was it about this story that uh, – uh, that grabbed your attention and, and made you have to write it? It was the character first. Um, uh, usually, I, I wanted to write a dragon book. I, I suppose I'm going through the genres uh, like a folder, seeing what what, I've, what haven't I done. And, uh, I'd like to do a vampire story at some point. Uh, but I realized I'd really like to do a dragon story. And as soon as I started to think about that, uh, the old question reared its head is how can – your dragon story be different. Um, what are dragons usually like? Uh, and uh, the, I suppose the trope would be the dragon is a, he would often be seen as very destructive, but also quite noble, uh, sometimes very avaricious, very fond of his gold, uh, but usually not the central character and usually not a huge amount of character development. Um, which is fine, uh, but I, I really wanted the dragon to be the main character. And I, so I began to think how to do that. How do you build a book around a dragon um, in a way that's believable to the reader, in, in a way that they accept it um, from the get-go that this guy is a dragon. So my dragon started to take shape slowly in my head, and he moved away from that noble gigantic destructive character towards a more modest sized uh seven foot tall dragon who was quite indulgent uh in that he liked to drink a lot of vodka he liked to watch uh tv most of the time so over the centuries he had slipped into this sedentary kind of life where everything was going great and all he wanted to do was live out his days in the bayou uh just smoking cigars occasionally and, and watching uh, flash dance on repeat. And I thought that was funny because he was, had <laughs> almost was become human in that he was starting to sound a bit like me <laughs> watching Netflix and, you know, having a glass of wine. And, uh, so, and I thought that is inherently funny that this dragon is not what we expect. Uh, and then the, the story built up and Louisiana was very kind to me because they had actually, already come up with their own legend uh, of the Honey Island monster um, who was uh, created apparently in a very ignoble fashion when a circus train crashed into the uh, the Pearl River and uh, a gorilla escaped. And then as the story goes, and I didn't make up this story, uh, mated with an alligator and this monster was born. And I just thought to myself, if you were from a race of noble dragons, how fed up would you be that that's what people thought, that you were like a monkey-alligator hybrid? And, and which is obviously anatomically impossible, uh, but uh, Vern gets very irate about that, that every time he's spotted, people go, oh, look, there's the, here's the monkey-alligator guy. And uh, he, yeah, he, over the years, that he's, there's quite a lot of a chagrin in his in his vodka martinis uh, when he hears those stories. So all these little things make me smile in my office. And if I, I think if I'm smiling in my office, somewhere out there, there are like-minded people. Maybe not, maybe not too many. Maybe a, a whole bucket load. I don't know, but who will who will have a little smile at the idea of a dragon uh, being teed off because he's been uh, mistaken for a, a monkey alligator. That's so <laughs> funny. Um, I, I actually live just uh, just on the outside of Cajun country and uh, not far from the Pearl River. Nice. Um, a, a little, I should a little have talked to you. Of, of I should have talking. talked to you a long time ago. I, decided, oh, if I had I, known. You, <laughs> I was lucky. All, all of my mother's. 
Yeah, all of my mother's family are, are from down in Cajun country. And um, what struck me, one, uh, the absurdity of the whole thing um, just made me laugh uh, in, in you know, just uh, an unexpected uh, I was like, what in the world is he doing? And 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 I I loved it instantly. Um, but you you really nail the uh, the culture and the feel, um, you know, in this wildly absurd kind of way. Um, what did you do to to prepare to to write these characters and and this place? Um, I used the old uh, reliable Mister Internet uh, because I'm not looking for uh, facts as such as impressions. And so I went online and I watched a lot of shows about guys that who, who, you know, who hunt down alligators who are gone rogue. And also I read a lot of newspaper articles about new Orleans and the, uh, the crime wars there. And also about the office of constable, uh, up around Pearl river, all around that County actually. And, uh, I just spent hours and hours and hours, uh, researching the area, everything from the kind of plant uh, and uh, you know marine life that lives that live in the river, it just no no detail was too small. And as you know, you don't really want to heap all that on the reader. Uh, you know, you don't want to shovel on your research because that becomes really obvious. It's oh, this guy has not been here, and so what he's doing is he's giving us a hundred facts about uh so he, he's like this is mr wikipedia that's what we're getting so you have to just layer right. we're, it we're getting a list of bullet points yeah so you you try and layer it in casually with throwaway remarks and you let the reader's mind paint in the rest but where i really was lucky it was that one of the harper collins copy editors uh was from that area um you guys probably are you know you maybe know each other i don't know but so she kept me honest, and also she would tell me, "Yeah, that's that's right, that's correct," because you don't want to be one of these tourists who goes into New Orleans and starts saying Nolans all the time, as if they're homegrown. You know, it, it really it rings so false. So I was lucky to have a real live uh, Louisiana person on the team who would uh, put me straight uh, whenever I strayed off the path, because there's nothing worse. I think than someone coming in from the outside and misrepresenting uh, your your own hometown. So uh, I'm I've been very fortunate in that the people who they sent it out to read the proofs, and uh, that was one of the things that came back that it felt very right to them. It felt like I, that there was a nice representation of Louisiana, and I really didn't want to go into Louisiana and then start saying. Uh, make the characters all rednecks or something. I had no interest in that because I'm a country person myself, and that kind of happens to us in Ireland. Is that you know the country people are we're all we're all the idiots, and I didn't want to do that. So I mean, I think Squib is a great character. I really love his mother. She's a great character. There's another guy called Bodie, uh, and I made sure that the bad guy he's from Florida, <laughs> so he's not from <laughs> he's not from he's not from Louisiana. At all, he's just uh, he just came he just came in and uh, he's the, he's the constable. So all the Louisiana people are really are really cool people and smart people, and uh, we have a good time. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen when I get to Florida. <laughs> that, might be, that might be a problem. <laughs> well, you know, there's 50 states. Yeah. Sometimes you just have to lose just one. Just lose one. You know, yeah. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when. When you're working on a premise for a new book, um, and this premise is just absolutely absurd. Yeah. Um, but there's, you know, there, there are kind of two reactions to uh, absurd premises. Uh, one is this is, you know, completely enchanting and I love it. And it's, it's, just, it's, it's absurd in the way that it makes me laugh, yeah. but, but pulls me into the story. Or there's this is completely absurd. Why would someone do this? Yeah. Um, w what do you think it is uh, about a premise that that engages us and pulls us in instead of repels us? Well, it's I think, first of all, you have to be able to the the reader has to be the type of person who can say, OK, I'll, I'll give this five pages. It sounds nuts, but I'm going to give it five pages. Uh, but there are people who cannot do that they just say no 
It's not for me. Um, and that's fine. That's just not the book for them. All my books are a little bit, they have very out there premises. So I, I just feel they're not for a lot of people. Um, and, I, and I don't mind that. I mean, there's a lot of rock bands, a lot of uh, writers, and there are a lot of musicians and a lot of painters who are not for everybody. Uh, and that's okay. You don't, we can't all be number one in the charts all the time. Uh, but that's, that's fine too. I mean, I just can, all I can do is do things, uh, that I hope make people, some people smile. Uh, I, I know I'm not going to get everybody, but I'll get some people. And, and that's, that's all you can do. And you can't try. I have actually, I have tried. I've said to myself, okay, uh, you're going to write straight down the line, classic thriller, no messing about you know, no ridiculous plot twists. All the characters are going to be recognizable. Um, you, you're going to know what you get as soon as you read the blurb on the back. Uh, but I couldn't do that. I, I tried to do it. And it's not, I'm not saying I couldn't do that because I'm so great. I wasn't able to write that because it's a different kind of talent. It's a different kind of talent, just as valid. Uh, I mean, some of the greatest sort of writers, um, in the world, just, I mean, even the the Jack Reacher books, for example, like they're amazing books. I could never write one of those. Uh, but, but I can do this quirky little dragon book uh, in the bayou. So, you know, each to their own, you know, like if, if Jack Reacher, I don't know, is the Beatles, the, well, then I'm the monkeys, you know, so <laughs> there, there's room for us both. That's, that's a great comparison. Um, the, the other thing that, um, that kind of, uh, jumps out at you about high fire is this is, uh, for, um, a very different audience. Yeah. Um, this is, this is not Artemis Fowl. No. Um, this is, uh, you know, this dragon is a vodka drinker. Um, you know, is it, the book is extremely irreverent and in, in the best kind of way. Um, what, was that intentional from the beginning or as the story unfolded for you, did you just realize this was going to be a more mature, uh, you know, aimed toward a more mature audience? Well, I tell you, it started off as a kid's book. Uh, it was going to be, a, I suppose, quite the traditional look at the grumpy old guy who takes in the tear away and they both meet somewhere in the middle and become better people because of it. Uh, so, so like a, a good night, Mister Tom, or something like that. And uh, but I I knew it was wrong. I started writing it, and I just thought, no, I'm not feeling this dragon. Uh, but as soon as he started drinking and swearing, I thought, yep, now we've got him. And uh, but then it, of course, it became an uh, an adult book, so I had to go back to the beginning kind of rewrite it a little bit but as i said when you're writing for kids and writing for adults the only difference for me is that the material would be appropriate uh so there wasn't an, a huge amount of uh changing to do maybe instead of a flesh wound like an 18 style you know there's a big explosion but nobody dies i would have a, a big explosion but two people die so uh you know it just up that those stakes a little bit but uh, really, if you took out maybe five or six passages and uh, all the swear words, I think it would be totally fine for kids. But for for teenagers, I would say YA. But no, I wouldn't. Have, I I wouldn't say in the state it's currently in. Um, it's it's suitable for for young people. Uh, so, but I do know. I mean, I, that you have to be careful because people think. Oh, they see my name and they say, oh, well, it's a kid's book, then I'll buy that. So uh, I, I try and say in every interview that I do that it certainly is not uh, uh, suitable for kids, that it is not a kid's book, and I wouldn't like to see it falling into the hands of an eight or nine-year-old. Right. W when you're writing um, this book, did your internal editor um, ever kick in and you find yourself kind of pulling punches uh, or um, maybe – you know, uh, feeling constricted um, in the way that, that maybe you would be writing Artemis and then have to tell yourself, oh, OK, no, this is this is for, you know, a, a broader audience or just when once you kind of settled that fact in your mind, um, did it just kind of come out freely? 
No, it was the it was the first example there where occasionally I would find myself saying, "Oh, don't do that because that's quite gruesome." Or, uh, you know, that's not really. And then you would remember and a weight would lift and you go, oh, if it's good in the story, uh, do do it. Let's go. And I felt what I would do is I would really go for it. And then if I managed to to sell it to a publisher, I would let my editor pull me back. So I just really rolled up my sleeves and, you know, and I just went all out. But I, my, um, but then I discovered Oh, I'm not really that gruesome a person, you know. You know, there are a couple of bets in it that are, you know, but they're also inventive. You know, they're not just. Uh, it's not like a serial killer book where everyone gets their face peeled off and, uh, you know, something crawled. They, the killer has left a butterfly in their mouth or something. It's not like that. It, this is just. There's three or four quite interesting uh, deaths, I suppose dragon related deaths but that's about it uh, two really that are would stand out so, so i discovered i'm not that as bad as i thought i was going to be i thought of this was going to be 20 years of me staying away from all this material and i could finally cut loose and i did cut loose but my cutting loose was not as uh i i, I, I wasn't bad as i thought i was going to be i was quite relieved actually <laughs> i'm not that bad a guy <laughs> <laughs> there are some some wonderful turns of phrases in this book um you know for instance like an alligator's jaws are wide like satan's hedge clippers that's that's a, a very southern uh u.s kind of phrase my my grandmother used to say things like it's it's hot as satan's change purse out here <laughs> or, or something like that yeah you know? that's great um, i i laughed yeah. every time i came across something like that that you put in yeah. um was, were there particular reasons for those or just as you fell into the the voice of this book did did you just did, did those things just come to you a lot of them just came to me but i think when i'm writing a book uh sometimes you find yourself getting a little bit banal so you just it's very you're just move maybe nothing big is happening but you've got to move a character from his desk to his boat uh and so you say, I've got to spice this up some. So I've got to have a turn of phrase here that's going to make even that interesting. So when I'm going back through a passage, if I find out that if I find to my own dissatisfaction that it's a little bit boring, then I try and come up with a, a turn of phrase that I feel fits in with the locale. So even though this, is a, this book has a, a universal narrator, it's kind of I try to write write it as though it has been written by someone from Louisiana, so it's all a it's a very interesting exercise and it it's a great way to keep you really involved and you have to keep you have to keep you really on top of your task uh, if you're using a voice that's not naturally your own it it makes you work for every sentence and every uh, paragraph. And again, sometimes it didn't pay off and my editor would say, no, we would never say something like that. It doesn't really ring true. And I mean, that, that one about uh, Satan's uh, nail clippers or whatever, that, hedge clippers, uh, that's, qu that's quite twee, but it just about makes the cut. You know, it just about gets in there in that it's funny enough, it's funny enough that you would smile, but not so twee that you would groan, uh, I hope. Um, but the, then again, it is for a very specific type of reader, i.e. someone who is here. You're here to have fun. You know, you are here to enjoy yourself. You're not here to learn anything. You just want to spend two hours chuckling uh, at the end of a day, which I think is quite important. The, the older I get, the more important uh, I think that is. And uh, just to, especially with the world in the state it's in, um, at the moment, uh, every part of the world, I think a little chuckle at the end of, of the day is no harm. Absolutely. Um, Owen, in, in the, uh, in, in your illustrious writing career and in the pursuit of 50 books, like we talked earlier, um, how has your writing process changed from the beginning? Um, do you still approach the beginning of a story the same way? Uh, are there any tools that you've developed or picked up along the way that have helped you 
um, you know, maybe in the planning process or anything like that? I have my process has, has really changed uh, as a young man, a uh, younger man uh, in my 20s and 30s, I suppose. I really could write anywhere and I wrote on anything. Um, I would hand write for the first 10 or 15, first 10 or 12 years, I think. I hand wrote everything uh, on spiral pads uh, and I could write lying down, sitting up. I had, when I was at home, I had a plank of wood. Uh, which um, I was very fond of and I would just put on my knee and work long hours into the night. And I find now I'm not able to work to that extent anymore. I don't really tend to do the 2 two a.m.s. Um, I have my, maybe it's because I've been doing this for, for 30 years that I have about six hours in a day where I can focus I like everything to be exactly in its place, whereas when I was younger, I didn't need that. But now I have a really nice office. I think I've become gentrified, or I'm, 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 you know, I need to have my office, and I need to have, my, I have a nice speaker, and I play my 1980s music. Uh, I have a picture of David Bowie, done by our, our your own wonderful Tony D. Terlizzi, who sent me a gift of that, and uh, I, I find that I can only really work properly in this environment. Uh, but luckily I have so much edits to do on other projects that when I'm on a train or a plane or an automobile, uh, I just edit stuff. And, uh, and that's a very good way to spend that time. Um, I, as regards the process itself, uh, I used to be very linear in that I start at the beginning and I write to the end, but now I've discovered that if I have an idea for a scene, I write that straight away because rather than going over it a hundred times in my head. So by the, when I actually get to it uh, in the narrative, it's gone stale. I write it while I'm still excited about it. And then I put all the pieces together at the end, like a jigsaw. Um, I do plan. I'd like to do a plan, but it's constantly evolving. So it's like, it is like a safety net. If you like, I write a plan. So I know I can get from beginning to end. Uh, but usually I take a different route. But one thing I will say, uh, and I and I believe from talking to author friends of mine, um, I have a crisis in the middle of, of almost every single book that I've ever written in that I get about two thirds in and I I feel there's a big hole where I wasn't expecting. I don't know what to put in that hole. And then I start to that ripples out and I doubt the whole book. And it usually takes me about a month to get over that or to get past it to the point where I feel it's worth finishing the book. And a few times I haven't got past it. So it's a strange thing because it's almost self-fulfilling at this point in that, okay, I, the hole must be coming uh, soon. And it does it, then it arrives. And then I'm, uh, it just, I, there's no shortcut. I just have to wait it out. And uh, that happens every single time. Isn't writing such an uh, an interesting um, endeavor? You know, if someone is a carpenter and he makes you know rocking chairs or something, um, I, I'll bet that that he doesn't get to a point in the middle where he starts doubting his craftsmanship. Um, but writing is like every project is its own thing. It's like it's like a, a, like doing it all over again yeah. for the first time. It's a it's such a crazy thing. Oh, you never wake up and say, "Well, I'm good now. I know what I'm doing." Right. <laughs> right. It's all, all my problems are solved. Every time it feels like, uh, here we go again. It, it's like the first time. And, uh, I mean, yes, you know, you've picked up a few tricks, but I, I, mean, I still think, you know, maybe no one will want to publish this book. I, probably not as much like that as I used to. Uh, but definitely I, I, I don't take for granted that my agent's going to like it or even want to sell it, or it's going to be an, it's going to be a priority for her. Every step of the way, I'm trying to make sure it's the best it can be um, for whoever's going to be looking at it as a possible project. So, um, yeah, and I, lo I don't like to hand in my books um, unless I feel they are 100% done. Except actually this one. I, with this book, I, I, I felt it was done, but I felt there were a few passages that might not make it through because they were a little wacky. But uh, fortunately, I think more or less everything made it, so um, I'm very happy. But uh, no, 
I, I think you, under, you understand that you, you just never feel like you're now a good writer. And I, if you start feeling like that, I think you're probably, probably where you stagnate a little bit. Right, right. There's the, some of that humility is a good thing to, to fire, to keep the fire in your belly. Yeah, I, I've had, and you can see, I don't know, is it bluster or bravado, but the people who are uh, yet to be published, uh, sometimes they approach you and they say, listen, I've, I've written a book. I don't want to boast, but it is way better than Lord of the Rings. And you're thinking that <laughs> you would not say, it, the fact that you are saying that, uh, makes me think that it probably isn't way better than Lord of the Rings. Right. Lord of the Rings, <laughs> but uh, but usually, uh, I think what we were speaking about earlier is just you. There's no shortcut for writing those hundred thousand, two hundred thousand words that are never going to see the light of day. Uh, that, but you have to kind of earn those stripes. And but nowadays, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes writers, and I'm not trying to be patronizing, but people write a book, they send it to a publisher, it doesn't get published, and, and then uh, they just put it on Kindle. And sometimes that's a mistake because the people on the internet are savage. They will just, you know, tear you to bits. And that is not the way, that is not the kind of constructive, that's not constructive criticism. You need constructive criticism. But that someone tells you, you have a talent Absolutely. But there's a few things you need to brush up on. Uh, you don't want to go to the internet for that advice because I, I don't <laughs> think it's the best place to go. Um, because even if you're, a, you know, a Booker Prize winning author, people on the internet are still going to uh, tear you to shreds. So imagine how much more difficult it is for uh, if you're young and you're, you haven't really, your skin hasn't toughened up by getting a hundred bad reviews. And then you release your work that you've been working on for five years and you put it on the internet and it's just dismissed. It's just dismissed uh, very quickly. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of a, it can be heartbreaking. I've met people who've had their heart broken and have never gone back to writing. So um, I, I would say try and get it published your own way first and then maybe do number two and, and see where that takes should be four. Uh, putting it out on the internet. Well, and and for the folks that do choose to self-publish or yeah. you know indie publish, as the popular uh, you know phrase is now, um, get an honest editor to go yeah, through it absolutely. first. And yeah, go do you know hire a professional editor, get honest feedback. Yeah, um, you know because it it is a, a legitimate form of publishing, but just it doesn't mean to just willy nilly publish. Yeah. Uh, you know, and get, also get honest criticism. Yeah. And also it is, it is, a, it is a business. And uh, I have, I've got a friend who, uh, his name is, uh, Paul Bryan and he put out three books, um, on Kindle or, or Amazon and, uh, in the published them, but he put a year's research into how that worked. And he know, he knew you had to go on, a lot of blogs and you have to do a lot of blog appearances and tours and you go on people's websites and then they go on your website. You do a lot of question, you know, Q and A's and you just have to kind of work that scene. Uh, and it's so much harder if you don't have a publisher behind you, but he did it. And it, like, I think he sold in tens of thousands of his books. And then he got, uh, he got picked up by, uh, I suppose a more traditional publisher. So it definitely, definitely can work. But you really have to know what arena you're going into, and uh, you and you have to work. Yeah, there's no. Yeah, you gotta. He he quit his job, and he just did that. He said, "I'm going to spend a year doing this and see if I can make it work." And uh, and that's exactly what he did. I think that's fantastic yeah. advice. Um, Owen, thank you so much for coming on the show today. The new book is High Fire. Yeah. It's available everywhere at, when when folks are hearing this at hardcover, audiobook, and Kindle edition. Um, I absolutely love the book. Oh, I know you. everyone else is too. We're gonna we're gonna put a link to it in the show notes. If if folks are uh, you know wanting to dig into your back catalog and read up on news about what's going on with you, is there a place where they can connect with you online? Well, I, I'm on uh, Instagram, just on call for I, and I love Instagram because it's a very positive place. And also owencalfer.com, uh, I do have a website, so I put up um, any tours I'm doing, 
any little videos I've made. It's all stuff like that. I'm, I'm not very good, I will admit, on the virtual world. Um, I kind of missed that boat. I have honestly never played a video game. So I'm, uh, I don't, I'm not great at that, but I, I, I think what's up there is honest and it's me. And if you want to read little bits of stuff, you can do that. And, um, but what I like to do is I like to go on tour and I like to get out and I, I like to meet people face to face and see what they liked and see what they didn't like and, uh, and take all of that on board. I love it. I love it. Um, oh, and thank you so much. Thank for you. No, it was great. I, today. I loved it. Our talk. This has been a great pleasure. Yeah. Stay tuned now for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Fox's The Ember War. The near future. Humanity's only hope of survival entered the solar system at nearly the speed of light. The probe slowed as the sun's heliosphere disrupted the graviton wave it rode in on from the abyss of deep space. Awakened by the sudden deceleration, the probe absorbed the electromagnetic spectrum utilized by its target species and assessed the technological sophistication of the sole sentient species on Earth. The probe adjusted its course to take it into the system's primary. If the humans couldn't survive, with its help, what was to come, then the probe would annihilate itself. There would be no trace of it for the enemy and no chance of humanity's existence beyond the time it had until the enemy arrived. The probe analyzed filed patents, military expenditures, birth rates, mathematical advancement, and space exploration. The first assessment fell within the margin of error of survival and extinction for humanity. The probe's programming allowed for limited, autonomous decision-making choice being a rare luxury for the probe's class of artificial intelligence. The probe found itself in a position to choose between ending its mission in the sun's fire and a mathematically improbable defense of humanity, and the potential compromise of its much larger mission. Given the rare opportunity to make its own decision, the probe opted to dither. In the week it took to pass into Jupiter's orbit, the probe took in more data. It scoured the Internet for factors to add to the assessment, but the assessment remained the same. Unlikely, but possible. By the time it shot past Mars, the probe still hadn't made a decision. As the time to adjust course for Earth or continue into the Sun approached, the probe conducted a final scan of cloud storage servers for any new information and found something interesting. While the new information made only a negligible impact on the assessment, the probe adjusted course to Earth. It hadn't traveled all this way for nothing. In the desert south of Phoenix, Arizona, it landed with no more fanfare than a slight thump and a few startled cows. Then it broke into the local cell network and made a call. Mark Ibarra awoke to his phone ringing at max volume, playing a pop ditty that he hated with vehemence. He rolled off the mattress that lay on the floor and crawled on his hands and knees to where his cell was recharging. His roommate, who paid the majority of their rent and got to sleep on an actual bed, grumbled and let off a slew of slurred insults. Mark reached his cell and slapped at it until the offending music ended. He blinked sleep from his eyes and tried to focus on the caller's name on the screen. The only people who'd call at this ungodly hour were his family in Bosque country, or maybe Jessica in his applied robotics course wanted a late night study break. The name on the screen was Answer Me. He closed an eye and reread the name. It was way too early, or too late, depending on one's point of view, for this nonsense. He turned the ringer off and went back to bed. Sleep was about to claim him when the phone rang again, just as loudly as last time, but now with a disco anthem. Seriously? His roommate slurred. 
Mark declined the call and powered the phone off. He flopped back on his bed and curled into his blanket. To hell with my first class, he thought. Arizona State University had a lax attendance policy, one which he'd abused for nights like this. The cell erupted with big band music. Mark took his head out from beneath the covers and looked at his phone like it was a thing possessed. The phone vibrated so hard that it practically danced a jig on the floor, and the screen flashed Answer Me over and over again as music blared. Dude, said his roommate, now sitting up in his bed. Mark swiped the phone off the charging cord, and the music stopped. The caller's name undulated with a rainbow of colors, and an arrow appeared on the screen, pointing to the button he had to press to answer the call. When did I get this app? He thought. Mark sighed and left the bedroom, meandering into the hallway bathroom with the grace of a zombie. The battered mattress he slept on played hell with his back and left him stiff every morning. Dropping his boxers, he took a seat on the toilet and answered the call, determined to return this caller's civility with some interesting background noise. What? He murmured. Mark Ibarra, I need to see you. The voice was mechanical, asexual in its monotone. Do you have any friggin' idea what time it is? Wait, who the hell is this? You must come to me immediately. We must discuss the mathematical proof you have stored in document title This Can't Be Right. Dot doc. Mark shot to his feet. The boxers around his ankles tripped him up, and he stumbled out of the bathroom and fell against the wall. His elbow punched a hole in the drywall, and the cell clattered to the floor. He scooped the phone back up and struggled to breathe as a sudden asthma attack came over him. <laughs> how? How? He couldn't finish his question until he found his inhaler in the kitchen mere steps away in the tiny apartment. He took a deep breath from the inhaler and felt the tightness leave his lungs. That someone knew of his proof was impossible. He'd finished it earlier that night, and had encrypted it several times before loading it into a cloud file that shouldn't have been linked to him in any way. How do you know about that? he asked. You must come to me immediately. There is little time. Look at your screen the robotic voice said. His screen changed to a map program, displaying a pin in an open field just off the highway, connecting Phoenix to the suburb of Maricopa. Come. Now. Mark grabbed his keys. An hour later, his jeans ripped from scaling a barbed wire fence, Mark was surrounded by desert scrub. The blue of the morning rose behind him, where his beat-up Honda waited on the side of the highway. With his cell to his ear, Mark stopped and looked around before deciding how to continue. Spiked ocotillo plants looked a lot like benign mesquite trees in the darkness. A Native American casino in the distance served as his north star, helping him keep his bearings. You're not out here, are you? I'm being punked, aren't I? He asked the mysterious caller. You are 9.26 meters to my east-southeast. Punk, decayed wood, used as tinder. Are you on fire? The caller said. Mark rolled his eyes. This wasn't the first time the caller had used the non-standard meanings of words during what passed as conversation between the two. Mark had tried to get the caller to explain how he knew about his theorem and why they had to meet in the middle of the desert. The caller had refused to say anything. He would only reiterate that Mark had to come quickly to see him, chiding him every time Mark deviated from the provided driving directions. If you're so close, why can't I see you? He asked. He took a few steps in what he thought was a northwesterly direction and squished into a cow patty.